Welcome to Behind the Balance Sheet, Candid Conversations with Financial Leaders, the podcast that takes you deep into the minds of the masters behind the numbers. Join host Chad Dean as he connects with financial leaders as they share their journeys so that we can gain valuable insight from their failures and triumphs. Get ready for candid conversations, behind the scenes anecdotes, and practical wisdom that will transform the way you think about your career in finance. Now put down the balance sheet and listen in. Welcome and thank you everybody for joining us for our very first episode of Behind the Balance Sheet. And I'm excited to be here for a couple of reasons. One, because it's our first episode. And number two is because of our guest today, Ian McCready. Uh, before we get into that, I'll just jump into a little bit of the genesis behind uh, behind the balance sheet, why uh, we're doing this. So a couple of years ago, I had this idea of, I'm always about helping people learn and continuing to learn through their careers. And I'm a big proponent of that. And there's a source that I can go to and learn how to be, I'm a recruiter. I can learn how to be a better recruiter. And so that I'm looking to create a source for people that want to be financial leaders and they can go to this resource and listen to different episodes and pick up nuggets uh, for their careers and what they can do. And I'm the goal of this episode is just to help one person. I think, uh, I think it'd be great if we just got one person to listen to this, but if we're able to actually help one person in their career, that to me is a success. I think it will end up impacting a lot more people than that, but that's the goal of this. So um, I love helping people. And I know that my first guest today loves helping people. I can just tell because the first time that I met him, he wanted to help me with an issue that I was having and spent a considerable amount of time when I was there to talk about him, he started talking about me and how he could help me. And so I think we have a great guest today. And I'm super excited to have you on. Well, I appreciate it. I'm very excited to be here. Fantastic. Especially for episode one. Absolutely. Well, I picked you because I knew that you were going to be a good guest. So no pressure. <laughs> All right. So uh, why don't we start with just a little bit about you and, and you know, tell us what's, what's all about Ian McCready. Yeah, so it's a, uh, that's a great question. Um, from a professional standpoint, I'm the CFO of a insure tech company that's headquartered out of Detroit, but I operate out of Phoenix. Uh, I've been in the Valley for 10 years. Um, from a personal standpoint, uh, married, uh, one kid. Um, she's awesome, just turned three. Um, great family, uh, uh, immediate family. Uh, everybody lives here now. My parents moved here, my sister lives here. Uh, she also has kids, so it's great to be surrounded by good people, especially ones that are close to you. Uh, that's that's basically it. Fantastic. And where'd you grow up? Grew up in Chicago, uh, northwest side. Okay. Yeah. And when did you find your way to Phoenix? I came here 12 years ago this year um, for work. Yeah. Um, I was working for an investment banking firm in Chicago, um, Houlihan Smith & Company. It's split into two separate entities, Houlihan Capital and Madison Street Capital. And I had the opportunity to leave with one of our MDs who started a small advisory shop. And so I initially stayed in Chicago. We opened an office there and then also had an office in Arizona. Uh, our broker dealer partner was out of Kansas City. Um, so we had offices kind of all across the country. Um, ultimately, uh, we consolidated to a single large office in Ahwatukee. And that's what brought me out here. So when we consolidated to a single office, I came down here with, uh, with another of our partners um, and then a couple of people that worked for us, analysts. And that was, uh, that's what brought me out here. So I'm doing this, uh, this for people that have honestly come to Phoenix, right? Because it's yep. hard to network in this town. And, but maybe people are listening to this outside of Phoenix. I'm just kind of curious, like you came to Phoenix because of the business opportunity, but was it on your radar? Number one, and number two, your family, a lot of your family followed you out here. So explain that to me. Yeah. So, uh, no, no chance. I did not ever anticipate coming to Phoenix, uh, which would have been a mistake had I not, uh, explored that. Um, but when I came here, my initial thought, and this is, I was just having a conversation with my cousin this past weekend, and she said, I distinctly remember that you had a conversation with me before you went to Phoenix that you were going to be there for one to two years tops, get things stabilized within the business, and then move back to Chicago or go somewhere else. Um, I think the Valley and, and Phoenix in general um, has changed quite a bit over the last decade. And maybe I just missed a lot of the 
uh, the good aspects of living here from a business standpoint prior to coming. I think that's probably accurate. Uh, but I think it's also grown and evolved quite a bit over the last 10 years. And it's a lot easier to find people in similar positions now than it was then. And what's interesting is you're working remotely, right? Yep. For a Chicago company, Yep. which is fascinating. So that has also just the, the evolution of the COVID and the, the remote workforce has allowed a lot more people to uh, relocate to Phoenix and work remotely. And it's bringing more leaders, especially financial leaders, uh, to the Valley. So that's kind of interesting. So let's go back to you and, you know, what was the genesis of having an interest in the world of finance? What, where did that stem from? Yes, it's a, a really good question. and something that I've thought about quite a bit over the last, I don't know, 15 years. Um, I've always been interested in finance since I was a kid, but a different element of it at the time. So I was obsessed with stocks. And I used to look at uh, the closing, uh, the closing prices every day with my dad in the newspaper the following morning, and he would teach me, you know, basic uh, principles around valuation and things like that. However, my interest at the time was what I would say, uh, looking back now, as misguided. So my interest in in stocks and and finance in general was specifically tied to trying to make a lot of money. Um, and, you know, of course, making a lot of money is a great thing or can be a great thing if you if you use it correctly. But I was driven purely by wanting to make a lot of money, uh, just under the assumption that that would make me make me happy in life. And um, and I think looking back, that's that's not accurate. But that, that's what got me thinking about uh, a career in in finance. So you were thinking about that. And then when you got to college, did you know what you wanted to do? No, I was all over the place. I thought I was going to be an attorney. So I went, my original major was poli sci. Then I switched to economics. And then ultimately I wound up uh, moving forward in corporate finance, but it cost me, you know, almost a year and a half of extra uh, coursework. Um, so that's okay. It's a good thing. I learned a lot from it, but I, I did not, did not know what I was going to do post post-college. So you, you chose finance. Yep. Okay. And you went to school where? DePaul. Ah, fantastic. So as you're getting your degree and you're going through your upper level classes, did you have vision of where you were going to be uh, once you graduated? No. Um, I, uh, I did definitely did not have any idea what I was going to do post-graduation. I assumed I was going to start some type of a company. Uh, I figured that I was going to go out and raise, uh, raise some money uh, from venture capital uh, with some you know, trendy idea, whether it be uh, a social network or something like that. Uh, completely misguided at the time. Ultimately, when I left school, I did wind up taking a job at an investment banking firm in Chicago. Uh, really good experience for me, uh, but I would say it was a, and I don't want to disparage the entity itself because they do a lot of good deals, but let's call it like a second tier uh, iBank. It was a boutique firm and they did a lot of transactions, but they, they were not a feeder um, out of really a lot of really good schools. So you didn't see a ton of, you know, double Ivy graduates coming and working for us. However, some of our MDs did fall into that category, but I learned a tremendous amount in that role um, without the expectation of that's why I was going to go there. Mm -hmm. So you were there how long? Uh, I was there for close to three years. And as you were there working, what did you realize about where you wanted to go in your career? Was there some things that happened that said, you know what, maybe I want to go here? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think when I was there, um, I never thought that I would wind up working in a role for a long period of time. I, I, I thought that I would work for an entity where I worked on a lot of different transactions. So I like the transactional nature of investment banking. I like that you can come in and learn a lot about an industry, but then see how a lot of different companies within that industry operate and then, you know, move on after, you know, three, six, nine, 12 months, depending on what the engagement was. If it's a buy side engagement, you might work with somebody for a lot longer. And ultimately, I think when I was leaving there, I was hoping to get into private equity, or I thought that would be really an interesting path for me. Um, and, and that's not exactly what happened, but it was, um, uh, that was what I was thinking when I, when I left. Mm -hmm. And where'd you end up going next? So next was Private Capital Alliance. That was the entity that I was talking about that, that brought me out to Phoenix. Um, great mentor, uh, our CEO and founder of that entity, uh, Shane O'Grady, who lives in the Valley and runs uh, a mortgage lending business here, uh, Life Changer Loans, uh, was who, who ultimately um, brought me in into that fold. And so our idea there was to go out and effectively replicate on a smaller basis what uh, Houlihan Capital was doing 
um, out of the Phoenix and Chicago office. Uh, same business development model, which is a little bit uh, inverse to what a lot of the traditional investment banks would would do. So you have a lot of uh, research analysts or associates sourcing deals or out actively shopping shopping for opportunities. Um, versus MDs just levering their networks to bring deals in and then having the analysts work on putting together decks. So long story short, came out here, thought we'd effectively try to replicate that, made some modifications, identified that something we were really good at was assisting um, later stage uh, uh, VC-backed companies in raising additional funds. So it could be anybody raising a B, C, or a D round. You know, sometimes we would look at A round stuff. Problem with that business is um, venture capital funds don't like paying um, uh, success fees to investment banks. So ultimately, we were taking very low fees. Um, a lot of them were non-success based. And then our thought process was we would ultimately get uh, bigger transactional fees down the road when they either you know, went public or had a, a divestiture. Uh, did, didn't realize how long the cycle was going to take. So you know, just put us in a, a, a position from a cash standpoint that didn't really make sense, uh, wasn't going to make sense for a long period of time. So we, uh, we ended that. And what were you doing for the firm? Um, so I was uh, primarily outsourcing deals, um, and then I managed a team of analysts and associates, um, and that that was the role. So sourcing deals is sales. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Love business development. Really? Yeah. I think it's really important. You know, I think one of the things that we'll probably talk about today is is the role itself, right? And I think that um, something that gets misunderstood about like a CFO role or a finance driven role is that a lot of it is a people role, right? Uh, you have to be able to communicate with people, whether they're internal or external to your organization. Um, but yeah, love, love people, love business development. Were you good at sales in the very beginning? Did were you no, just no, a natural at it? No, no, I just had to work really hard. I mean, I, um, I was, I was miserable at selling. Um, I think the thing that made me ultimately successful was that I didn't give up. And I was willing at the time in my life, uh, I think it's some component of luck, some component of just working hard. I had the time. Uh, I didn't have a family. I was able to just go out and just work a lot more than than other people maybe were willing to. Interesting. And did you learn on your own or do you have a good mentor? I had a ton of great mentors. It wasn't one person. I mean, I had a lot of people that taught me. You know, Shane was a fantastic mentor and taught me much of what I know. I think I, um, I'm still a bad salesperson by what a lot of salespeople would define good or bad. Um, I sell more consultatively. And I think I spend a lot of time um, getting into the nitty gritty or really understanding a business before being able to sell to it, where like a naturally gifted salesperson or someone who follows uh, a lot of the psychology of sales literature or trainings uh, would sell a different way. Gotcha. So this, this company basically disbanded. Is that yep. what happened? Okay. Yep. So where were you at that time? Did you have another opportunity lined up? What were you thinking at that point in time? Oh, I was not in a great, uh, you know, headspace. I think the hard part was we, we, we had to let go of all of our staff, right? So now it's just basically me and Shane at the end, and we have a bunch of clients, right, that have paid us, even if it's a small amount of money, uh, they paid us, and it's our job to service those clients and make sure that they get the best experience possible. Um, and many of them were in the middle of capital raises at that point. So we were helping them, you know, put the decks together, work through their financial models, go out and actually source capital through relationships that we either had established or were going to establish on their behalf. Um, and when you're in that position and they trust you and you've helped them get to the place where they're going out to raise money, uh, it's very difficult to abandon them even if uh, even if the fee structure doesn't make sense, right? So ultimately we put in a lot of extra time uh, working with these clients, trying to help them advance and uh, couldn't, couldn't abandon them. So I had to take another another job, wound up at uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, business banking. Um, it was something that uh, I wasn't overly happy with at the time because I, I felt like it was a step back from like an investment banking role. However, it was the best possible thing that could have happened to me because it let me go out in the Phoenix marketplace and network with business owners as well as other bankers and people in finance, whether it was through you know FEI or directly through connections that I made and really understand that we do have a thriving business community in this market. And, we, and, and more importantly, we have a thriving lower middle market. I'd say companies that do 20 to $500 million a year in sales, there's far more of them here than I, than I knew existed. And having the opportunity to go out and, and meet and work in that, that sector was fantastic. So that's what led me to my first CFO role, um, was just through a client of mine that introduced me to uh, a friend of his that runs, ran, still runs a, a pretty large business in the Phoenix area. 
So the opportunity found you. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a, so that's what is interesting about Phoenix is we are a cottage and you know, there's just so many smaller companies here and people don't realize that. And they look at it and say, well, there aren't a whole lot of fortune 500 companies here headquartered here, which is absolutely accurate. Uh, but we do have a lot of divisions of these fortune 500s. And then we have all these great companies, smaller companies, mid-sized companies that are here. So this opportunity found you and the title was uh, VP of finance, VP of finance. Mm -hmm. And so at this point in your career, you're thinking, well, I wanted to be, you know, raising money and, and running my own business. And now you're still continuing to work for people. What what's evolving in your mind? What's your outlook for your career at that point in time? Go put yourself back in those shoes. What were you thinking at that point in time of where, what had changed? Well, I think a lot of things, um, you know, I think you grow up quite a bit between when you're, well, I think a lot of people grow up between when they're 18 and let's call it 25. And so this was 2015. So I would have been nearing 30 at that point. Uh, I was like 28 when I took the role. Um, and things had changed for me in terms of what I wanted, I guess, out of life and, and what I was willing to trade off for what I wanted. So I think if I had stayed the traditional investment banking track or moved back into that role, it would have put me in a position where I would have been exchanging um, uh, a lot of what makes me happy for money. Uh, when I realized that what's the point of that, because the reason that I want money is to make myself happy. Uh, so ultimately making this move was uh, at first what I thought a decision that that was going to be not problematic. I thought it was a great move for me. It was a really exciting opportunity, but I thought this is going to cement the fact that I'm no longer going to be in investment banking or in private equity or in venture capital. And I'm just going to be an in industry, right? I thought just an in industry, I'll put you know quotes around that. Uh, it was awesome. I'm so happy. It was just a phenomenal opportunity um, that, that led me to, to a lot of happiness, both personally and professionally. And what did you learn there about yourself, about the VP of finance uh, role? What did you learn? Well, I should, I should give a little bit of context. So the entity itself was, was and is run by the founder. Um, it was in manufactured housing. It's the largest, it's currently the largest independent manufactured housing dealership group in the country. Uh, started in the late 90s, 1999, by a single owner um, out of Phoenix. Uh, grew really aggressively, took a small step back when there was some difficulties from a financing standpoint, and then started growing again. So when I joined, there were 15 locations across the country. Uh, just closed the prior year with, I think it was roughly $40 million in sales. And the uh, uh, the CEO was hell-bent on continuing to grow. Um, and looking back, that's the exact type of person I needed to learn from and tie myself to. So he was an awesome mentor, continues to be a really good uh, friend of mine and a mentor of mine. But from 2015, when I joined until when I left uh, at the beginning of this year, the company had grown from you know, roughly $40 million in revenue with 15 locations to having uh, 29 company owned stores, uh, you know, 200 plus million dollars in revenue, and then having added additional subsidiaries and affiliates that were either acquired or added organically throughout that, that last seven to eight year period. So I consider him like a visionary founder, and I loved working for him. It taught me a lot about, um, about what it means to be successful. And I think what's going to make you happy along the way. He's not the type of uh, individual who's flashy and out buying, you know, Ferraris or Lamborghinis, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but, but I think that his obsession with the business itself and watching it grow and what that meant was not tied specifically to what it was going to give him or financially back. That was just a uh, effect of what he was doing and uh, putting myself in the position to uh, do the same thing and not be so driven by what I was expecting the end result to be, but instead enjoy the journey and just let whatever was going to come out of it be the effect uh, was a, a massive change in perspective for me. I love that. Yeah. That was some serious growth. Now you say people grow up between 18 and 25. I didn't grow up till I was like 30. So am I, don't judge me on that. <laughs> so you go into industry. Yep. Did you know what you were doing? No, right. no. I mean like I, somewhat, yes, because I knew how to model. And I think a lot of what the company needed was, uh, uh, you get to like 40 million in sales. And I think that's an inflection point for a lot of organizations. They say, great, we can continue on at this point without having a lot of refined processes in terms of how we plan for things going forward. 
Now, the the owner of that company is not a huge fan of traditional budgets, and I, I think he's accurate in why he's not a fan about them. He doesn't like traditional budgets because ultimately, uh, if you're successful, they're going to limit your growth. So the way that he would prefer to budget would be to look at it a different way. And this is something that I, I worked with him to figure out is, how do we look at what a percentage of our revenues should be and budget that way. So marketing as an example, or a percentage of gross profit or percentage of whatever, right? We can still use metrics to determine where we're going or if we're successful as we're going there, but but that's, we don't have to look at it and say, we can only spend $175,000 a month for marketing next year. Well, if we're successful, we should be able to spend $700,000 a month and, and, and ultimately yield more bottom line off of that than, than if we just limit ourselves at 175. So where I'm going with that is I, um, I had a pretty good background in modeling and knowing how to build models. And he allowed me and gave me the freedom and the flexibility to go out and basically do whatever I wanted with the historical data, great accounting department at this particular entity. So we had loads of good data that we can take and then manipulate and put into a model and try to understand um, one, uh, what's working well currently uh, that may have, uh, that may, we may have missed, or we haven't, we haven't found out that we can, we can exponentially grow or what maybe hasn't been working and, and how do we take these things, uh, these metrics or unit economics and apply them to future growth and identify more quickly, are we going to be successful in a location? Because the life cycle of a transaction in that industry, uh, it could be somewhat long. So you open a, a new store and likely you're not going to reach cash flow positive on a monthly basis for anywhere between 18 and 36 months. And the difference between that is a lot of a lot of things. It could be how long is the build time because they're a retailer, so they're relying upon a builder. If there's a large backlog of homes that are waiting to be built for customers, then it delays your ability to recognize revenue. Um, there's other things that happen as well. So if you're in an environment from a regulatory standpoint where permitting takes a long time to get in place, um, then you're waiting a long time to get paid. So how do we how do we look at everything together and tie, tie it all together and figure out, you know, what is going to make us successful as we grow? And you learned all that modeling from which particular job do you, do you go back to? Um, I think that most of that was at Private Capital Alliance. So I spent a, a majority of my time actually building models with clients and then testing them. Um, I learned a lot of the basics during, at, you know, at, at Hulahan Capital, right, of course. But uh, most of the DCF modeling doesn't really apply to scenario analysis. And so at Private Capital Alliance, I assisted a lot of clients in building out models that weren't specifically for raising money, but were also used to make decisions about what they're going to do as they grew or identify, you know, what is important, especially when you're working with early stage companies, they have to be able to pivot. So there needs need to be multiple paths forward, right? It doesn't mean that you're exiting your vertical, but you have to be able to make some adjustments and, and know in advance what they are and or know what's working or what's not. Are we on track to get to where we need to go? Mm -hmm. So you come in VP of finance, what's mm -hmm. your title? What, did you have any reports? I didn't have any direct reports. So I oversighted some, some areas within the first couple of years, but I had no direct reports out of the gate. Um, within six months, though, we owned another entity that was in manufacturing distribution of decorative laser lights for residential and commercial applications. And that particular entity was uh, was struggling um, uh, because of a number of factors, uh, primarily because it's mostly a seasonal business. So you have to wind up placing your inventory orders pretty far in advance um, uh, of the season. So you have to uh, you have to make some decisions about about how much inventory you want to stock for the following year. And we wound up in a position where the market was becoming commodified. So a lot of players started entering the space with a cheaper product and then distributing them through big box retailers. And that was uh, an issue for us because while the quality of their goods were low um, or, or less significantly lesser than ours and they, and they failed regularly, um, if you're making the decision about buying something that's four times expensive or not, which which direction are you going, right? And we only have a short window to sell. So we want to put some challenges in that business. And I, I took over uh, the day-to-day -day operations there uh, pretty quickly. And you had how many people reporting to you? So there's like 25 people there. Um, at that and point. they were all reporting to you? Well, I, I, I guess it depends on how you how you consider reporting. So yes, in effect, they were. We, we scaled back that business pretty quickly and went down to a core of like, let's call it 10 people, and then ultimately five, and then three, and then two as we, as we okay. wound down. So would you consider that your first true leadership where you're leading people? Is that your first leadership role? Well, no. Uh, so at Houlihan Capital, I had a small team of analysts that were 
that were on my team. Mm -hmm. And I failed miserably in that role. Uh, and when I say I failed miserably, I mean like miserably. I could not make it work. I just assumed that everybody had to operate the same way as me. So my management style at that time was uh, to just like kick people in the teeth, figuratively speaking, if they weren't if they weren't getting things done as quickly as I thought they should be getting them done. Um, Cause I respond really well to that style of management. I found out that that is not a good style of management for most people, not even for myself. I mean, I might respond to it, but it doesn't, you're not going to get the most out of me by being aggressive. Um, so that, did you find that out there or later on? No, I found that out there. I had to, I had to take a step back from that position because I was doing such a horrible job and it was stressing me out to the point where I just was not getting the results that I needed, which was, you know, hurting everybody on my team. Uh, so I, I took a step back there um, and then didn't manage people again until we were at Private Capital Alliance. And again, my management role was relatively small. It was oversight. Shane handled most of the management responsibilities. So while I technically had analysts reporting to me, they were all really reporting into him. So when when did you have your first um, after that first sure. uh, leadership experience? When was your next one where you had actual people reporting to you For, at the the laser manufacturing business? Okay. So what did you learn, and how did you learn to adjust your leadership style? And I think this is important because I think you know I talk to so many young people and are like, I want to be a leader. I want to manage people. And I think in my head, do you really know what that means? Because I thought I knew how to be a leader and then I started managing people and I was similar to you. I was like, do it just like I do. I'm out in front and just follow me. And I turned around and I looked and there was nobody behind me. And I had to learn a different style of leadership and it's, and I'm still learning. And it, yes. I believe it's an ongoing process throughout your whole career. So tell me about your development because as a CFO, you have to be a leader and it's important to, to grow that. So how did you learn? That's a, a great question. I, um, I learned through mistakes, right? The prior mistakes and then mistakes that I've, you know, I continue to make. I think what I found is that it's easy to identify problems or things that need to be fixed, but you can't always force them to be fixed quickly. You need to understand uh, who is required to fix those problems. Um, and then what is driving those people on an individual level? I think it's really easy to make blanket statements like, hey, look, these people are in our accounting department, so they're all the same. They have the same personality type. That's completely inaccurate. Like what drives um, one AR person versus what drives another AR person are not the same thing. So when I was talking a little bit earlier about uh, finance still being a people business, I think that holds very true. I think understanding the motivation behind why everybody is in the role that they're in or 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 what their background is or their goals, their visions, et cetera. And then being able to tie that into what problem needs to be fixed or what, if it's not a problem, what, what we're going after that could be improved or, or grown. Um, that's really, that's really what works. So I don't know that there's a like quote unquote management style that works really well for me or that I've learned. I think I've just taken the time to stop and try to understand what people's individual goals or objectives are and how I could help them get there. And if I assist them with that, they will always get done what we need to get done as a group. Did you read a book? Did you, did that just a light bulb go off in your head? That, because that's profound. And that's what a lot of the leadership uh, coaches out there and consultants talk about is find out what makes people tick and then uh, what their, what their why is. So how did you learn that just organically? I think it's a combination of a lot of things. I think it's watching, um, other people that I view as successful managers of people manage, and then just through osmosis, you know, learning it and absorbing it. I think it's, um, it's just natural organic growth of, of doing something, realizing it's not working at the level that I want it to work at, and then having to find a different way um, and just coming to that conclusion. And I think also it is reading books so, and or listening to, uh, to interviews and things of that nature. So I love to um, taking as much information as possible. I read quite a bit. Um, a lot of my friends like make fun of me jokingly that I, I read too much, but I keep, I keep a list. So I have my target every year is a hundred books that I read. I didn't reach it last year. I got to 96. Wow. Wow. Um, I'm only on pace for 65 I'm this year. So I don't... I'm sorry. You only got to 96. It's, uh, it's disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> it is disappointing. Cause when you're that close, you're like, well, could I have just shoved, you know, four, 425 page books in here and done it in a weekend? Yes. But, but that's not, that's not the point. I set it as a target because I think everybody should have a goal or objective for, for everything they do in their life. It works for me. It keeps me, uh, keeps me on track. 
um, you know, I think I, I look at a lot of successful people in life and I say, what makes them different than the person that is uh, not nearly successful, but puts out generally the same amount of effort. I don't think it's any, any more effort that is needed a lot of times. I think it's about organizing your life in a manner that gets you the results that you want. Um, so long story short, I, I read a lot. I can't, I can't say that there was a specific book uh, that, that guided me to this thought process, but there have been a ton of, ton of really good books. And I think, um, you know, Tim Ferriss talks about this a lot, but a lot of my really good mentors are people that I don't even know because I've read every, every one of their, their books and I feel like I understand them or watch their interviews or listen to their podcasts or whatever, whatever it may be. Lifelong learning. That yeah. is so important. And I, that's very respectful. That's a, that's a huge number. And uh, I don't even come close to that. I, I, I listen to audio books now. I kind of cheat. It's, I don't think it's cheating. I mean, if you look at the studies on it, it says that you retain that information the same way you would as if you read a book for oh, the most that's part. Good. That's yeah. fantastic. That makes me feel better. I appreciate that. But I don't count the audio books I listen to on my list just for what it's worth. Wow. Yeah. So these are, these are soft cover, hard cover, Back books yeah, and they have must to be... have a huge room just full of books. Yeah, my wife, my wife makes me get rid of them. I mean, so... <laughs> like my wife and my clothing, I got to get rid of my clothing. <laughs> so, okay, so you were acting essentially as a CFO with the VP title, or walk me through that. And when did you achieve the CFO title? And also, was that like your goal all of a sudden? Did it? I, oh, I'm now VP. I want to be CFO. Walk me through all that part of this this growth for you. That's, that's a, a good question. Um, so I don't think it was a true CFO role at that point. I was more um, like a director of FP&A role. That's what I would consider it. Most of my time was spent with the numbers and not with the people. Uh, I did spend a good amount of time with people trying to understand the business model, trying to understand the industry, um, really digging into those those things. But I, um, I was very heavily focused on modeling myself, building out the models, and just levering uh, the information I had in the models to make decisions or help guide things. Um, I don't know though what actually changed from from that role to like the CFO CFO titled role, but uh, we went through like a small I don't want to call it a restructure because that would make it sound like we had something wrong. I think we were just looking at um, working towards institutionalizing some of our processes. And one of the things that we did was realign some of our management structure so that uh, the VPs uh, reported into somebody else so that we we didn't have to have meetings of like nine people, right, all the time for every little issue. That's when I ultimately was given the CFO title um, and then had additional direct reports. So then, you know, accounting were reported into me. So our VP of accounting reported into me, our VP of field ops reported into me, uh, IT and marketing also reported in. And then we had a couple of subsidiaries uh, uh, where their heads reported in as well. So what was that like looking at your business card with CFO on it now? Yeah, I mean, I guess it, I guess it probably should have been more exciting than it was. I don't really see a big difference. I saw it as being, uh, I, if I was 25 and had the title, it would have been like a big boost to my ego. Um, and I probably would have been, uh, I don't have a, a good word for this that I could use on the radio, uh, but I just would, would not have been a very friendly person. It would just like boost my ego and I would have been like, hey, look, I'm the CFO, what have you. I don't really care. I, honestly, I don't think titles matter. I think they, they do matter, right? Um, but I don't think it, it should matter to you and how you act or, or how you feel about yourself. I think finding a role that you fit well into where you provide value to the organization and, and it's people, and then all of your external stakeholders is far more important than what your title is. So there was a point in life where I was super driven by getting to a title or getting to an income level or getting to whatever that was. And I think that's gone. Now it's really easy for me to say that because I have the title, I achieved the income level. Like some of these things have happened for me, right? But, um, uh, but looking, looking back, I think it's far less important to me now than it would have been earlier on in life. Interesting. So you, a new position finds you. Yep. Let's, because people are always interested, how do you grow your career? And you grew your career by making career moves, uh, switching jobs. How did this particular job find you? And uh, what ultimately made you decide to take it? Yeah, so um, probably two years ago, uh, the CEO of the entity I work for now, CoverTree, it's a InsureTech uh, MGA. We're VC backed. We have really good equity partners um, and it's in the manufactured home space still. So I was in the space already. Um, we, one of the, one of the affiliate entities for uh, the company that I worked for before 
was a retail insurance agency that focused specifically on distribution to manufactured home owners. So we sold uh, insurance for their, their primary home, uh, but we also sold them products that would tie to that. So it could be auto, uh, toy, um, basically anything, any insurance product that a person that owns a manufactured home would buy. Um, and I got a, a LinkedIn message about two years ago from an individual that was in the process, the founder and CEO, uh, one of the three founders, but the CEO um, of Covertree. And he's like, hey, can I pick your brain on some stuff? I know that, you know, National Mobile Home Insurance, which is the agency that was affiliated with Factor Expo Homes, um, is, is constantly showing up in our searches. Every time I go and search for mobile home insurance, I see your website or one of these Factor Expo websites continuously pop up. Um, I have to ask you, like, what, what are you doing? Tell me more about that. This is what we're trying to do. This is what we're trying to accomplish. We, we are creating a program for a balance sheet. We have a balance sheet partner. We're creating a program uh, where we're going to focus on distribution, uh, both direct to consumer and then through other partner channels, so like communities and uh, independent agencies, lenders, et cetera. And it's unique. It's specific to manufactured home. And our, our thesis on why we're going to be successful is that we're levering technology in a space where a lot of the current carriers, which is limited, um, are not. And it's going to help us with our, uh, our underwriting process to the point where we think that we can go out and offer better rates to the top segment of the market, the best risk in the market, um, while avoiding taking on the bad risk. And we can do this through, um, through data analytics and, and other, other technology that just other people in the space aren't using. But I wanna, I wanna ask you some questions about that. So I said, sure, let's uh, connect on this. We're always looking for other carriers to work with. I thought if we can get another carrier in the space, it just makes us more competitive as business. Why don't we connect? And if I can help somebody and they have a good VC uh, backers, then they're probably the real deal, right? And their primary VC backer at the time was Detroit Venture Partners, uh, which is uh, part of rock companies. It's Dan Gilbert, the owner of the Cavs uh, companies or Quicken, Quicken Loans. Um, so, uh, uh, we ultimately go down the, uh, the path of flying up to Detroit. Um, I go up there, meet with them at their corporate office. It's at Detroit venture partners, um, primary office where they have space that they're using. And I sat down with them in a conference room and I thought it was going to be a couple hour meeting. They asked some questions. We went back and forth. We just went up talking for like 10, 11 hours. And it was a fantastic meeting. And I came back. They said, why don't you join our advisory board? Uh, we think that you have the expertise in the industry um, that a lot of other people don't have. And, you know, you're excited about what we're trying to do. So, you know, we'd love to have you on the advisory board. So I joined their advisory board approximately two years ago. Um, and it's been really fun to watch them grow and develop. They've accomplished far more in the last two years than I thought was going to be possible. Um, and ultimately, uh, they came and said, you know, we're, we're at the next we're at the next phase of the business, right? We need to start not not to institutionalize in the way that I described with with Altissima. We need to start to put some processes in place to support, you know, raising the next round of capital and really going to the next level. And we think having you here full time would be beneficial. And this is a real struggle for me because I have a great relationship with you know the owner of the company that I, I worked for before, I mentor and a friend. Uh, but I looked at it and said, I'm nearing 40 at this point. And if I don't jump back into something that's tied to venture capital now, uh, that market will have moved away from me and there's not ever going to be an opportunity. And so outside of what I do professionally um, for work day to day, I also um, am an active angel investor um, and part of a couple of syndicates as well. So I put money into early stage companies and have a couple other advisory board roles as well. And this is good for me. Um, this is good for me to get back into the startup and VC ecosystem and understand who the players are today, which are different than they were 10, 15 years ago. Uh, a lot of the same people are still in the space. I have a lot of really good friends that are still in the business and a lot of good connections uh, that we can lever. Uh, but there's also a lot of new players in the space. It's evolved, it's changed. And I look around and it's full of people that are you know, 25, 26, 27, and it's exciting for me. So that was, that was the genesis of why I made the decision. So cool how it came full circle. Yeah. So they created this title for you or already existed the CFO title? No, they created it for me. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And, um, wow, that's, that's great. That's so neat how that happened. So let's, um, let's look back and at some moves and you've already said it, it's crazy how you talk about every job and it was great and it was great and you're very positive and optimistic individual, but what was one thing that you think that, that really happened to you that changed the entire course of your career that you haven't maybe already mentioned? Hmm. 
that's that's an interesting question. Um, I think uh, if I'm just being very direct, it was meeting my current wife. Um, she has helped me uh, grow in ways that I didn't expect that I would. Um, and she's pushed me towards making decisions that are going to make me happy at a core level, not on a surface level. And that is uh, invaluable. Wow. Okay. Well, that's fabulous. That's, and I'm, I'm, uh, lucky, I'm lucky to have met my wife as well, married 21 years. So I respect that. Awesome. So let's, um, what advice would you give to someone that's interviewing for their very first CFO position, whether they're in their current company or it's, it's, it's one outside their company? What advice would you give them? So it's, again, a good question. I think that um, I would need more context. I can answer it in a general way, but I think it depends. So if we look at the CFO role, I think, um, I think different people in different organizations look at the CFO role differently. So is it an accounting driven role? Is it a finance driven role? Is it tied to operations? The, the thing that I think um, I, would, I would focus on is that if someone's already in the process or considering interviewing or pursuing a CFO role, uh, they really need to move beyond the numbers. The numbers are awesome and they lead you in a direction, but they need to know the people within the organization and they need to understand uh, what makes their business successful or unsuccessful and what makes other businesses in their industry successful or unsuccessful, both in market and external to their current geographic market. If, if you're looking at interviewing or if you're looking at a CFO role and you can't name, um, you know, three smaller, three comparable and three larger competitors in your space and what makes them successful or unsuccessful, you're not, you're not prepared for the role. Um, not that you can't become prepared for the role, but you really need to understand a lot more than just the numbers. And that's where I think people get a little bit off track. So that's not the greatest answer. No, that's but... a fabulous answer. That's uh, one that I didn't expect. And that's, that's really good, good information for people. And it, it, a lot, most of it comes down to do your research, not just in the numbers, but in the industry itself. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. You have to do your research. Mm -hmm. um, so let's, um, let's go back to your younger self. Well, but, but actually, before I asked that, there was one thing that popped up. So do you feel that not having a, a um, formal accounting background has hindered your your um, CFO responsibilities or anything like that? And, and, and if you know, if there was a lack of knowledge, how did you overcome that? So it definitely would have hindered me if we didn't have an awesome VP of accounting that was uh, a, a huge proponent for me um, and a giant support system. So having a really good um, head of accounting uh, that was able to answer questions that I have on a granular level about why, you know, this journal entry was this or why, um, you know, just just very, very sometimes basic accounting questions that uh, that you take for granted. Um, having somebody there to answer, if you, if you, if you already had the knowledge, you would take for granted the fact that um, other people might not have it. Um, so yeah, it would have been a hindrance, but I think that there's not much that can't be overcome. Accounting is not that complicated. You know, I read or have, have in my past read like FASB rules and I understand gap uh, to an extent because I had to analyze financial statements um, in investment banking and I was very comfortable with the different the different financial statements that would be out there and the different sets of books that companies might carry. Um, however, when you get into like GL detail stuff, that's where I I would have found it to be a hindrance. But I think it I think it would depend on the size of the organization that someone is a CFO for and how that impacts it. So when you have two hundred million dollars a year of revenue passing through an entity, you're probably not going to dig so far into individual GL detail that. Uh, that it becomes a problem if you don't understand the mechanics of how something moved in or out of an account. You have a good team at that point that's going to be able to point in the right direction. If you're the CFO of maybe a 20-person company with you know two million dollars in revenue, then you're probably uh, wearing both a finance and an accounting hat, or finance and accounting hats, and it's much more important that you truly have an accounting background. So for me, uh, it really wasn't a hindrance, but that's primarily because. I had ex extremely good resources around me, and then I was willing to learn. So I asked a lot of questions and dug really, really pretty far into the detail. Um, so I'd say that th that's the best answer I can give. Okay, and I'm going to put you on spot here because I didn't give you this question in advance. But 
Um, you have worked for a publicly traded company, you've worked for a privately owned company, and you've uh, worked for VC sponsored. Is there like a difference that sticks out in your head for, in those three different types of organizations? Yeah, I would never want to be the CFO for a public health company. Um, uh, SOX compliance is a nightmare. Um, at the last entity that I was with, we sold 12 locations to a publicly held company, but continued to operate them. And because we continued to operate them under a management agreement, we had to modify a lot of our accounting practices to SOX and uh, SOX compliant accounting practices. And the amount of time that you end up spending um, digging into uh, what's what's in compliance or out of compliance uh, is just a nightmare. So I think that's the biggest thing. I think it's the level of detail at which uh, reporting actually has to happen. Um, on the VC side, I find uh, venture partners are really great to work with because whoever on their team is the primary contact that's digging into the financials, whether it's quarterly, monthly, whatever it is that they're looking at, depending on what stage you're at. Um, there are usually people that spend a lot of time working, so they're co they have a, a very similar work ethic to me, so we can connect at whatever time it is. Um, they have good financial background, like much better than myself. Um, they're coming out of, you know, uh, bulge bracket investment banks. They have been been through the entire um, the entire process of advancing themselves there before moving over to the VC world. So I, I like working with them. Much of what they're focused on is not the quality of accounting. Uh, of course, you need good quality accounting, but they're focused on uh, what are the numbers that you've already reported mean in relation to where you're going and how are you modifying your business model, um, the actual operational side of the business model, not the financial side of the business model, to, um, to capitalize on opportunity you found in those numbers and to move away from problems that you may have identified in those numbers. So I really enjoy working uh, in the VC back space. On the privately held side, I think the companies and the quality of reporting that they have vary widely. I think that most companies that are entering the middle market probably need to have uh, better reporting and more checks and balances because it's way too easy for a small problem to become a big problem and nobody ever notice it um, in in those those entities. Yeah, interesting. So uh, let's go back and and what would you tell your younger self? And you can go back to any point that you want, or maybe a couple different points. But uh, what would you tell your younger self now? Yeah, so I would, there's a few things, if, I, if you don't mind me hitting a few different this points. This is fabulous stuff, because that's what, we, you know, this is the learning process that you go through. And maybe somebody hears something from you that somebody else told them, but maybe it's their father and, you know, nobody listens to their father, right? You got to hear it from somebody else. I, I know that from having two teenage boys, but um, so, yeah, it's, I think this is great, this is great um, content. I think this gets repeated a lot by a lot of different people, but you have to uh, enjoy the journey, uh, the destination you're going to wind up at either way. You don't know what it's going to be. But if you're so focused on getting to the destination, then you miss the 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 part that actually makes up the most time, um, and and that's disappointing. Time is the one depreciating asset that we all share, right? And there's not a standard schedule for it, so you don't know when it's going to end. So you might as well enjoy what you do every day. Um, I think that it would be easy for me to to say today that to tell my my younger self to uh, relax, but I think that. It's hard for me to determine um, how much of what we would consider like quote unquote success has come from uh, just grinding it out. And I think a lot of it has. I mean, I'd like to tell young people like enjoy your life, go travel, do this, that and the other. And they should. But if you want to get to a place in in a relatively short period of time, you're going to have to work hard. And a lot of people work hard, but you're going to have to work smart as well. And you're going to have to sacrifice. So um, I would tell myself that it is all worth it. Um, I think if you, if you're going to pursue it, but the biggest thing is, uh, I wish I can go back and it's not something I could tell my younger self, but I can, I'd like to impress upon my younger self that, um, uh, money is far less important than, uh, than I, than I, at the time I, I thought it was, um, be a good person. Um, it's, it's a lot easier to lose money and make it back than it is to lose friendships and, uh, and, and try to get them back. You can always, you know, that that's, I think important. Oh, that's amazing. Great, great, great advice. Uh, and so going back um, to, let's say, somebody that's in school 
and they want they don't know what they want to do, but maybe CFOs up there. Sure. What kind of advice would you give them if they want to achieve the CFO title? They're just beginning, right? So what do you what advice do you give to them to achieve that title someday? I think I would um, I would ask them what they think the CFO role is and and why that's what they want to do first to understand if they want to be the CFO of you know a privately held company in the lower middle market or if they want to be the CFO of a large publicly held company. If you want to be the CFO of a large publicly held company, you'd have to take a very different career path than I took. I think you need to go into public accounting or investment banking at a bulge bracket level, really focus very much on your schooling and follow the defined path, which is going to be a grind, right? And you're going to rise slowly throughout uh, whatever organizations that you're in, and you're going to have to play a political game, and you're eventually going to get there. I suppose it's possible that you can come in as like an FP&A analyst and work your way up if you have the right pedigree from an education standpoint in another, a large publicly held company and arrive at that place. But I think it's a very different journey than I've taken. So if I was talking to somebody that wanted to be the CFO of a lower middle market or a middle market company or a VC back company, I would tell them that they need to expose themselves to uh, a lot of different industries and people, and they need to obviously have you know the classical training. They need to know you know they need to know how to build the DCF model. That is important. Uh, maybe it's not important because they're not out there uh, doing valuation work for a bunch of different clients. But it's important to understand what drives value and what are the individual components that go into modeling because it's all just a it's just a guess anyways right so how do you make the best guess possible you can't build the dcf model if you can't model out what your expectation is for um for projected earnings and you can't accurately to any degree model out your projected earnings if you don't understand the business so you need to go back to fundamentally the basics of understanding the business and understanding the people i think when you're in a smaller organization one, two, three people can make a wild difference in the amount of success that a company has. I look at um, uh, the production level that happens on a, a singular basis in like a 10 person sales department and you lose one really good person and it throws all the numbers off. So you need to understand the context of what's working and why it's, and not only what's working, but why it's working. And so my advice would be um, read a lot, talk to a lot of people in the industry, build a good network, nothing for me uh, would have happened positively if I didn't have an incredible network. I have so many people that I've leaned on throughout the years that I still lean on that I can just you know shoot a message on LinkedIn, send them a text, give them a call, and they they're willing to take the call or respond back to me or help me. And uh, I'm just very lucky. So um, I think that's the advice I'd give them is you know focus on your education, of course. But once you wind up uh, getting into a role, uh, don't uh, don't just do the bare minimum. You're going to have to go outside of what you're what whatever is defined as your role is within the organization and really learn about all the other departments don't be afraid to ask a lot of questions and uh and challenge things unbelievable fantastic advice and and it's coming from an individual that's worked in public private and and vc sponsored so um great advice so unless i haven't asked you anything that you really wanted to share i mean you've shared everything and it's greatly appreciated is there anything else that you wanted to add well, I think you highlighted at the beginning of the show that it's really important to give back. And I think that's something that um, uh, that you're able to do uh, during the journey. I see a lot of people, um, or I've met a lot of people that think, hey, I need to wait until I get to the successful place to give back, whether that's financially, whether it's time, uh, other resources. I think you need to give back along the way. And that could be uh, you know, directly to charities that you support that are doing really good work on things that you believe in. Um, it could be, you know, just giving back to people within your network and trying to help them advance. Um, I think you need to uh, do it not because you think it's going to get you somewhere, but because it's the right thing to do. And, you know, you you do that. And I think, uh, I think regardless of your success, which you're obviously quite successful, um, it's something that you would have done. And that's, it's important. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, helping other people and, and, you know the charity work. I'm an, I'm uh, on the advisory board for the Folds of Honor. Brings oh, me a lot yep. of a lot of pleasure. And um, so, wonderful advice. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, just you shared everything. And uh, real quick, how can people reach out to you if they uh, if you want to pay it forward to somebody and they they have a question for you on what you spoke about today? Yeah. So best way, shoot me a LinkedIn message. I'll get back to you really quickly. Okay. Yep. And it's Ian McCready. Yep. Okay. At Cover Tree. 
And uh, if anybody needs to reach me and wants additional questions answered, Chad Dean, Integrated Management, you can just Google that and I show up on LinkedIn. And uh, that's it. So thank you very much, Ian. We, we made it through our first show. You are an excellent guest and a big help in this. And, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's great. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Behind the Balance Sheet, Candid Conversations with Financial Leaders. We encourage you to apply the knowledge and wisdom shared in these conversations to your own career. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to our podcast and leave a review. Your feedback is important to us as we continue to bring you more candid conversations and thought-provoking insights from successful financial leaders.